Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Draves, and I'm here to introduce Howard Rheingold, who is joining us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Howard is here today to discuss his book, NetSmart, How to Thrive Online. Like it or not, knowing how to make use of online tools without being overloaded with too much information is an essential ingredient to personal success in the 21st century. The key to discover the way to use social media intelligently, humanely, and above all, mindfully is critical. Howard Rheingold is an influential writer and visiting lecturer at Stanford and UC Berkeley. He has authored several books, including Tools for Thought, The Virtual Community, and Smart Mobs. Please join me in welcoming him back to Microsoft. Hello, thank you. I'm familiar with Microsoft Research, so one of the, the great advantages of talking to really smart people is that I can cover a lot of material more quickly. So essentially I'm going to do an hour-long presentation. I'm going to leave out the uh, beginner's uh, explanation and I'm going to do it in a, a half an hour. But I've also added some material particularly for you as uh, tool makers. So um, if you are uh, concerned that our use of digital media are, are making us as individuals and our society uh, shallow, then um, why not teach more people how to swim and we can all explore the, the deep end of the pool. Uh, the way you use a search engine or stream video from your phone or update your Facebook status matters to you and to me and to everyone because the way we use these media now are going to influence the way they are used and misused for decades to come. Very recently, a number of strong critiques of the pitfalls and the, the hidden costs of our use of digital media have emerged. A few of these critiques actually based on some empirical evidence. And I take technology criticism seriously and, and I I think you probably will agree to, with me that we should all look critically at our own uh, media practices and, and what they may be costing us. And while technology criticism is necessary, it is not sufficient. Knowing that something is broken or that it may cost more than you thought it did is not the same as telling you how to fix it. So instead of um, asking uh, Questions like, is Google making us stupid, or is Facebook commoditizing our privacy, or is Twitter uh, chopping our attention into uh, micro slices? Uh, all good questions. I have been asking more broadly, how do you use social media intelligently, humanely, and above all, mindfully? I've drawn on my own experience of nearly 30 years online. I've, I've looked at the research literature. There's 500 footnotes in the book. If you want to check out any of my claims, there should, there should be links for you to go to the, the source uh, material on that. And I've talked to a lot of the social media uh, leaders, people uh, whose names you know, Linda Stone foremost uh, among them, Jimmy, Jimmy Wales, uh, Dana Boyd, um, Barry Wellman, and uh, NetSmart is about what I've learned. Um, before I get into the actual literacies, I want to speak specifically to issues that concern you as, as tool makers here. Um, this is not the first time that new media transformed the way we think, learn, and communicate. Um, a woman by the name of Denise Schmant Besserat actually discovered the origins of writing. It started out as accounting. It started out as a business practice, and it was exapted to communicate things other than business transactions. And the fears of information overload are not new. They go at least as far back as Ecclesiastes. The same kind of things have been said whenever a new communication medium makes a lot of new uh, information available. 
And there uh, always seems to be a panic about information overload. And in the past, every time this has happened, innovators have reacted by creating new ways of organizing information. Um, too much handwritten text in the age of the alphabet led to schools, libraries, and scholars. And too much printed information led to alphabetization indexes, subject headings, taxonomies, reference books, encyclopedias, authors, critics, and editors, so, so much that we take for granted as part of the community of literacy was invented, in fact, uh, to deal with the information overload that the, the, the print revolution enabled. I go back to Doug Engelbart, and I know that I, I noticed in, in the hallway uh, references to, to uh, Butler Lampson, a lot of the, the people who were involved in creating personal computers and, and digital networks go back to Doug Engelbart's original 1962 paper. I'm sure that some of you have read it. If you have not read it and you work at Microsoft Research, you should go read it. It's uh, called Augmenting Human Intellect, and he wrote it in 1962. And, um, one of the things he wrote in, in that paper was about humans using language, artifacts, methodology, and training. And of course, we've seen the artifacts evolve billions of fold. He made this famous 1968 mother of all demos on a um, computer that probably had about uh, 8K of, of RAM. So um, today, uh, tools, um, literacies, and networks are uber intertwingled. We're starting with Mar uh, uh, Moore's Law, the uh, capacity to amplify technically has led to the ability, of course, to amplify our intellect and the interconnection of our personal mind amplifiers into networks have led to where we are today. And uh, that evolution certainly has not stopped. Today's toolmakers uh, would do well to look at emerging literacies. So that's what I want to talk about. Um, five uh, literacies uh, in particular, uh, starting with attention. OK. I'm not playing this, so I'm going to go on. Um, attention, participation, uh, collaboration, crap detection, and network awareness. So attention, of course, is the, the foundation of thinking and communicating. And um, I got uh, interested in this in, in particular when I was in a, a classroom and noticing that uh, that many of the students were looking at their computers instead of me. Some of them were, were checking things out to make sure I knew what I was talking about. Some of them were asking each other's questions. Some of them were undoubtedly Facebooking or on World of Warcraft. Um, I realized that they didn't know what it looked like from where I stood. So with their permission, I took a little video of them from the front of the classroom. And at, at the back of the classroom, I had another camera and notice, look at this student's screen here. Even though I, I took this video of them, I put it on YouTube, I projected it on the screen in front of the classroom, he decided he wanted to watch it on his computer while I was projecting it. I have no idea why. And then he took a look at my personal website. And then, this all happened within not too many seconds, he's, he went back to his email. So the interesting thing about this student is that he was a very rare A-plus student. Years go by without an A-plus. I'm sure if I had stopped him and said, what am I talking about, he would have been able to, to tell me. So um, research on multitasking, Cliff Nass's research at, at Stanford is often cited, has indicated pretty strongly that for 95% of people who think they are getting things done more effectively while they are multitasking, they are actually degrading their performance on the individual tasks. I think this guy must be one of those four or five percent who are able to do it. And the question is, was he just born this way, the way some people can run faster or jump higher? Or did he learn something? And if so, what did he learn and can others learn it as well? 
So when working with my students, um, thinking about this myself, talking to people like Linda Stone and Cliff Nass, I came to the conclusion that the most important lesson is, is mindfulness. And, and if that uh, sounds a little too spiritual for you, uh, metacognition is a, another word for it. And Wikipedia has a really good entry on metacognition. It simply means being aware of how you are deploying your attention. And the meditation practices that go back thousands of years are really based on, start with, simply becoming aware of what's going through your mind. So with my students, I do a number of attention probes in the classroom. Uh, for example, ringing a chime at random uh, intervals, and then people will write on a yellow sticky uh, what they're thinking if it's related to uh, what we're talking about. On an orange sticky, they'll write what they're thinking about if it's tangentially related, and on a red sticky, if it has nothing to do with what the discussion is at the moment, all anonymously, and then we all put them up on the whiteboard, and we get a, a sense of what's happening. We do a number of these attention probes uh, every time uh, we meet, and the objective here is to begin to develop an awareness of where our attention is, not only when we're online, but when we're, we're walking down the street. I'm sure many of you saw the, the video of the from the security camera in the mall of the young woman who walked into the fountain while texting. The Pew um, Internet Survey uh, claims that uh, through a scientific uh, survey, one in six Americans have bumped into something while uh, looking at their phone, while texting. When that, is, uh, when that mindfulness is directed towards the information that we are bringing in through digital media, I call it infotension. And when I talk about training infotention, part of it is on the cognitive side and part of it is on the tools side. So we all have to make very rapid decisions about what we're going to pay attention to online. Am I going to uh, pay attention to that little badge that says I've got a new email or am I going to wait until later? Am I going to click on that link in, in a tweet? Am I going to go look at the latest viral video or am I going to be doing something else? The, uh, objective of training this is to begin making these decisions uh, more consciously and after becoming more deliberate about it, um, becoming more deliberate and faster. You know, sometimes you want to pay attention to something. Sometimes you want to open a tab and pay attention to it later. Sometimes you just want to tag it and bookmark it because it's something that interests you and you, you don't know whether you're even going to look at it this week. So part of the training has to do with matching your attention to your tool set, matching your attentional strategy to your tool set. And I'll, I'll show you a, a screen uh, of that in a minute. The spatial arrangement of information online and the way we organize our priorities can be synced. And of course, priorities are up to you. Nobody else really um, can tell you what your priority is for today. You know what you need to get accomplished. So at the beginning of the day, I instruct people and I myself write down two or three goals for the day. I use the old right brain pen and paper and I put it on the corner of my desk so that every once in a while accidentally it will come to my attention. And when it does, I simply ask myself, where is my attention right now and do I need to bring it back to the task? Very similar to meditation on the breath where you simply observe your breath and when your mind wanders, you just go back to observing your breath. I took a leaf from uh, Professor B.J. Fogg at Stanford who's been studying how to cultivate habits and he has a simple three-part plan which is uh, start small. It only takes about 20 seconds to write down a couple of goals. Uh, find a place for it. I do it at the beginning of the day and I put it on my desktop and, um, and repeat and you've got a habit. So I I've used um, all of the RSS readers and um, I've settled on NetVibes because it gives me three levels of abstraction. I can have different dashboards for entirely different subjects. And on the dashboard, it's got a, a second level of abstraction, which are the tabs, which are draggable and droppable. And then it's got the feeds, which are also draggable and droppable. So I can put what the highest priority for today, according to what my priorities are, on the left, because we're accustomed to reading from left to right and top to bottom, and I can put the feeds that are updated the most often at the top. So there are days when I may just look at what's under the 
a leftmost tab, and there are days when I may look at all of them. And of course, the advantage of RSS readers is that you can very quickly scan the headlines and then decide whether you want to pay more attention to it later. This is what I mean by making uh, my goals visible daily. I just, uh, so that's uh, six words, three goals. Um, probably took me 10 seconds to write. So in the book, I get into a lot of detail, and I scaffold it with a lot of um, empirical research that I've found. So today, I just want to touch upon some of the highlights of, of attention. Attention can be trained. Uh, there's a lot of good neuroscience about this, although, of course, that's what meditative disciplines have claimed for uh, centuries. Breathe. So I learned this from, from Linda Stone. I assume you all know who I'm talking about when I say Linda Stone. Do you not? So go look her up. She was associated with Microsoft Research when, uh, when it was founded. She's an, an um, retired emeritus uh, employee, and she's responsible for me being here today. But she's been, and she's got an interesting blog on Huffington Post in which she gets into these issues. But she noticed that she was holding her breath while doing her email, and she started asking her friends, and it turns out that if you notice, if you, you look for it, you will notice that there are times when you hold your breath while you're doing your email. And this is connected to the fight or flight response, which was very useful to our ancestors. You're walking through the savanna, and there are all kinds of predators around, and you hear a noise. It's probably a good idea for you to stop and hold your breath. And at the same time, your adrenaline starts pumping, your endocrine system gets ready for fight or flight. This is very good if you want to survive in a crisis situation. It does have erosive effects on your health if you do it often. And of course, when you're sitting at, uh, at your desk and you're looking at your screen, you're not being uh, pursued by a saber tooth anything 500 times a day. So every once in a while, just stop and take a breath. Attention to intention is how the mind changes the brain. Although the, this sounds a little woo-woo, it really is how the neuroscience works. So Donald Hebb's uh, principle that, uh, that nerves or neurons that fire together, wire together, is a generalization that when you're having a particular thought or holding a particular image, there are particular neural networks that, that fire at that time. And the more you do that, the more you strengthen the connections between those neurons, the more you strengthen that network by holding the intention of noticing where your attention is, you are changing your brain. That is really the principle behind how meditation works, and it, it has been verified. There's a, a lot of uh, great recent books on the neuroscience of this. Um, so let's talk about critical consumption. I use a less polite term that I got from, from Hemingway, who said that every good journalist uh, needs to have a good internal crap detector. And I started on this when my daughter, um, who's now grown, was in middle school. This was uh, back when search engines had names like um, AltaVista and InfoSeek. And I told her, when she started using them for her papers, that you can go to the library and you get a book out, and you could disagree with the book, and the book's opinions might be wrong, but you can be pretty sure that there was an author, an editor, and a publisher who checked factual claims in that. If you go online and you put a query in, you can get the answer to any question within a couple of seconds. But it's up to you to determine whether that's good information, bad information, disinformation, or misinformation. So I sat her down, and I asked her to do a search on Martin Luther King, Jr. Had, does anybody know about this site? Martin Luther King, uh, a true historical examination. It's martinlutherking.org. Um, so you click on that, and it looks like it's a, a website about the civil rights leader. Um, if you look a little more closely at the articles, it has a, actually a pretty dim view of uh, Reverend King. So there is an author to this, and so my daughter said, well, how can I tell whether this is for real? I said, well, search on that author. And searching on that author was quite revealing. Uh, she, and she said, well, who's the author of the website? We couldn't find that. So I told her to take, take a look at who is, simple utility that enables anybody to put in a URL and find out who is legally responsible for that website. And so you put in um, martinlutherking.org, uh, and it turns out that the person who's responsible for it is Don Black at stormfront.org. So you do a search on 
stormfront.org, and it turns out that it's a white nationalist and supremacist neo-Nazi internet forum. It's what was known as a cloaked website. This has been used as an example so many times recently that they have actually come out of the closet about it and they put, put Stormfront on the front page of it. But when I first showed it to my daughter, um, it was cloaked. Um, this one was very scary the first time I found it because it did not offer the clues that it now offers that it is a hoax. And considering that there are people who get pregnant because they aren't entirely clear on where babies come from, I think it, it's, it's kind of scary, although it's funny. Um, it asks you to fill in your name and press the start test button. So I put in the name Joe, and I started the pregnancy test, and a, a flash animation came up that said, sit still while we scan you. <laughs> and then pregnancy dis detected. Congratulations, Joe, you're with child. I, so, and notice that they've got real ads over on this side. So I, you know, I think most people can tell that it's a, it's a joke, but maybe, maybe not. I couldn't help clicking on the next one. View my baby, it's a girl. Okay, one more click. Who's the daddy? It turns out to be Fabio. We can actually pick another daddy. So by this time, I think most people will know that this is not for real. I have a, actually a, a collection of these sites. Here's one um, that looks legit, looks like a pretty good design. This is a primate, a mandrill, who has been taught to understand English and can communicate with you through a keyboard. Um, totally bogus. The Pacific Northwest tree octopus, a, an endangered, non-existent species. Um, it's kind of funny. If you're a sixth grader, who knows? Um, so here, I've got a collection of, of these under, under crap detection. Uh, so again, I get into a lot of detail about this because I think it's all important. We can't and shouldn't police what people put online. If that was possible, we wouldn't have the web that we have today. What we can do is enable people to think a little bit more effectively about the information that they find. And when you're talking about medical information, um, who has not Googled their symptoms or their disease when, when they, they um, have a diagnosis um, could be fatal. And when you're talking about the political sphere, there's a, a lot of uh, bad information out there of various kinds. So, as I told my daughter, I urge my readers to think like a detective and try to put clues together. Don't accept, and a detective doesn't accept anything at the beginning and then uh, additively begins accepting things. Um, search to learn. You know, sometimes you just want to find out where the ne nearest pizza place is. But uh, if you're a student and you're using search to learn about a subject, you shouldn't stop with the first page of results, you shouldn't use one search engine, and you shouldn't uh, stop with the first search. You should look at the snippets that you get to refine your search. Look for authors if you can find, find them. If you don't, I would turn the credibility meter down and search on their names. And triangulate what journalists do is to try to find three sources. So when I saw a rumor on on Twitter that Egypt had shut down its internet that came under the category of interesting if true. And, um, but I wasn't going to pass that rumor along until I found three sources. I put out a query for, for information. Someone uh, told me that, that another person that I know to be uh, l legitimately in touch with activists in the Middle East was talking to someone in Egypt on the telephone and said that it was true. So that was a, a point there. Um, uh, I took the, the original rumor as one, one point. I still needed uh, another one, and someone reminded me that I could use ping to find out if sites in Egypt were up, and it turned out that all the ones that I tried were down. So I passed that rumor along, turned out to be true. However, uh, in the immediate af aftermath of the earthquake in Haiti, there was a rumor on Twitter that if you texted a certain number, uh, it would contribute money to sending medical personnel to Haiti. It turned out to be a cruel hoax, and the people who passed that rumor along were sorry that they did. They're sorry that they didn't triangulate it later. And um, recently, Eli Pariser has written the filter bubble about how search engines personalize. And a few years ago, Cass Sunstein, now at the, the, the White House, wrote about the Daily We, about the fear that now that people can bundle their own newspapers, they can get their own sources online, People are paying more and more attention to uh, information that they agree with. So um, my solution to this is to find people whose 
Um, intellect and honesty I respect, but whose opinions I disagree with, and pay attention to them. If nobody in your network annoys you, you are in an echo chamber. So participation, um, this is a Texas audience um, here. This is the hook 'em horns uh, sign. Um, we wouldn't be talking about uh, digital media or digital networks without uh, participation. Um, I just want to point out just a, f a few examples. A few years ago, Warner Brothers uh, attorneys tried to set, uh, shut down the, a, a Harry Potter uh, fan site, and uh, Heather Lover organized a worldwide boycott that backed those attorneys off within a couple of days, fast enough that they had not learned that she was 16 years old. Um, Bev Harris, a previously obscure blogger who was uh, obsessed with Diebold's voting uh, machines. Diebold makes voting machines that are used in a lot of elections, and their source code they have kept secret, and she found it online in an unprotected site. So she spread it around, and although she was an obscure blogger, it, it went up the food chain, and a lot of people knew about it. Swarthmore students put it on a server at Swarthmore. Uh, Diebold sued them, and federal court found for the students in that case. Wael uh, Gonim, the uh, Google executive, who was one of the, the many young activists who used Facebook in the Arab Spring. I, and of course, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the Google twins, um, these people were all in their teens or early 20s, and I emphasize their youth simply to, to emphasize the power of knowing how to participate online, the power of knowing how to create a website, to blog, to advocate, to use a wiki to organize. So I, I like this uh, power law of participation that Ro Ross Mayfield used to plot the low threshold with the tool against high threshold, and then low engagement with high engagement. People can start very low on the threshold of the, of the tool or the engagement. They can read, they can favorite, they can tag or like, they can comment, or they can move all the way up to creating collaborative intelligence of, of quite sophisticated types that I'll talk about. So there's a, um, a lot of different kinds of uh, curation tools, and curation is one of the forms of participation that's the easiest for people to create a kind of collective intelligence by filtering the best stuff for each other. It's one thing to be able to detect crap. It's another issue to find the best stuff. If you are an expert on a particular topic, you're, you're going to have to look through your information overload and, and reduce that to useful knowledge. And in the open source world, they call it scratching an itch. If a, a new printer comes out on the market and there's not a driver for it, then if you write the driver for that, it pays for you to put that in the, in the public code base. Not only are you signaling that you are someone who's cooperative, who deserves to be cooperated with later, but you're also enlisting a team of others to help you when they change that printer and you need to change the driver. We all have to tag and bookmark those things that we can't easily search for anyway. And the real genius of social bookmarking is that there's no additional cost, either financial or in terms of your effort, to make your choices public. And in the aggregate, those choices become a valuable public resource. You want to gain a reputation of, as an expert on a topic? Well, people who are interested in that topic will know very quickly if you know what you're talking about. And if you do, they're going to start paying regular attention to you and they're going to spread the word. In fact, curation is kind of a personal SEO in the sense that you are sending out signals, with, you know, whether you're interested in a particular breed of cat or a particular kind of programming language. People who are looking for that are going to find you. And if they find you and you know what you're talking about, they may collaborate with you. They may give you information that could be useful to you. So um, now we're seeing a lot of different platforms um, like uh, uh, Quora and Stack uh, Overflow that enable people to share knowledge, to ask questions, to give answers as a, a form of uh, participation. And again, uh, individual uh, acts of self-interest um, adding up to an uh, important public good. In the aggregate, Henry Jenkins believes that, that participation by more people online leads to a participatory culture. A person who thinks of herself as the passive consumer of culture created by others 
has a different sense of agency, a different sense of herself as a citizen from one who considers herself, in, in whatever small way, to be a contributor to digital culture. There are a jillion ways to participate online and new ones uh, emerging every day. So again, just the highlights here. Don't just consume, create. Architecture of participation was a term that Tim O'Reilly came up with to show how the architecture of, of a lot of online media enables people to, to make self-interested acts that add up to public goods. You know, one of the most clever architectures of participation was Napster. When people were downloading music from other users, by default, the folder on their desktop where they downloaded music to was open to other Napster users to download music from. So in that sense, it was, they, this was a sense in which people provision the resource that they consume while they're consuming it. Cory Doctorow called this um, cheap who shit grass. And I think that, th that architectures of participation are something that could be of value, value to you as tool makers. Curation is a lightweight form of collective intelligence. Um, and if you're going to participate, take a few minutes to figure out what the local customs are. What, what are the norms and boundaries of the local culture? And crap detect thyself before broadcasting questionable information. Curation is not just a matter of making choices. It's also a matter of maintaining your reputation for making excellent choices. So collaboration, ultimately the most powerful thing that digital media and networks provide is not just individual empowerment, amplification of your ability to think and communicate. It's the, the enabling of people to do things together in ways that they have not been able to do things before. So smart mobs, 10 years ago when I, I, smoke, I spoke in this room, I, um, I talked about the combination of the mobile phone, personal computer, and the internet lowering the threshold for collective action. Of course, we're seeing that everywhere from the Arab Spring to Occupy Wall Street. This was, when I spoke in Chile, they said, oh, the Penguin Revolution. So uh, public school students in Chile wear uniforms that are black and gray, so they call themselves penguins. The education is not funded very well in Chile, and they decided not only were they going to walk out of their classes, they chained the schools shut and they induced 700,000 Chilean citizens to join them in the streets. Uh, there's a dialogue about education in that country that consider, uh, continues to this day, and the Minister of Education resigned that night. Virtual communities, I first wrote about this in 1987, and my book of the same name was 1992. You know, whether you are playing casual games or you are a cancer patient, you are probably connected to other people and other parts of the world who provide you with information and support um, on a daily basis. Uh, don't tell me that a virtual community is not a real community uh, if you haven't been in one of those situations. Um, everybody here know about SETI at home? This is a couple of, couple of people. So SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, they suck down signals from outer space, they look for patterns in them, American taxpayers don't want to pay for the intense computation involved. So they created a screensaver, which they distributed. When your laptop, your desktop computer goes to sleep, the screensaver wakes up, downloads some of this data, runs a pattern recognition algorithm on it, sends the result back to headquarters. What's interesting about this is not messages from little purple people. So far, they haven't said that they found any. It was that they uh, amassed uh, 20 teraflops. Of, I don't have to explain that to you, 20 teraflops of computing power from a couple of million volunteers. And this was years ago. Now we've got uh, folding at home. If you go to folding.stanford.edu, you can help biochemists understand how protein molecules fold. There's a game to do that called Fold It. If you understand how a protein molecule folds, you can understand more about the immune system, more about creating new medicines, modeling weather. You know, in just a few years, we're going to have billions of people walking around with supercomputers in their pockets, linked at greater than what we consider to be broadband speed. So what kinds of computation, what kinds of computational tasks will people be able to tackle then together that they can't tackle today? Jim Gray, does anybody here know of Jim Gray? So 
I will, I'll just quickly repeat this story. Jim Gray was com computer scientist for Microsoft Research, was, was he not? And he took his boat out in San Francisco Bay one day, did not come back that night. So his friends at Google and NASA got pictures, his friends at, at, of that area, 3,500 square miles, friends at Microsoft and Amazon, cut those into half a million images and made them available on Mechanical Turk. And thousands of volunteers searched through these images. They did not find Jim Gray, but they put this ad hoc system together literally uh, within hours of him not coming back. So crowdsourcing, we usually think of something that businesses do, and we're going to see more and more businesses do it, but it's not the only uh, application of crowdsourcing. And now we're seeing crowdfunding. The U.S. Congress has now made um, crowdfunding of startups, SEC, compliant, up to $2 million. Collaborative consumption. We are seeing everything from um, uh, people finding a place to stay with Airbnb to, to uh, Zipcar, all kinds of ways that people are able to share resources that previously were not shareable because of the technology. And collective intelligence. Who would have believed the last time I was here that we would see millions of articles in something like 200 uh, languages created strictly by volunteers by this point. And more and more, this is something that I'm very excited about, is cooperative learning. Nowadays, if you want to learn something, you can probably go to YouTube. Everything from, from um, configuring a, um, a new ins uh, computer installation to how do you uh, fly fish. Um, somebody has made a YouTube about it. More and more people are using the resources available online, not just the um, sources of information, but the communication platforms to learn things together. You no longer have to go to a school. There are all kinds of platforms that have emerged for people to teach and learn from each other and with each other. So we have been told a story, at least since Darwin's time, that competition is the overwhelming aspect of everything from biology to business. But recent discoveries in a dozen different fields indicate that we have to shrink that picture of competition as being um, all-powerful to make room for what we now understand about cooperative arrangements and complex ind independencies. Um, I've got a TED talk on that if you want to hear more about that. Um, actions climb the curve of engagement um, with collaboration just as it does with participation. You can start out small and you can end up big. There are a wide variety of ways to collaborate as ways to participate. Enable Self-election. So the, the great power of Wikipedia is there's no central authority assigning someone to write on a local school district or a certain species of, of ant. The person who considers themselves knowledgeable about that topic self-elects to do that. And you eliminate the cost of management. Not everything can be done uh, by self-election, uh, but certainly you know that open source software um, is done largely. Um, by self-election. We don't really know the limits of social production. Not everything can be produced that way, but we don't know uh, what else might be. So uh, a survey on why people contribute to open source uh, um, code has, uh, has revealed that sticking to Microsoft is only about the fifth uh, priority. Uh, the first priority is learning how to code. Uh, the second uh, priority is enhancing uh, reputation, but also meeting others and adding to a public good. And some research seems to indicate that having a homogeneous community of people who are motivated either by altruism or by financial incentives is not as powerful as having a mixture of motives in that community. And this is an, a leitmotif uh, diversity that I'll come back to. Casual conversation builds trust. Um, Social capital, the ability for groups of people to do things together outside of formal structures like laws and contracts, comes from networks of trust and norms of reciprocity. It's why when you meet someone you don't know, you talk about sports or the weather, until you can get to trust them a little bit to disclose more. If you've got an online forum and people are supposed to be exchanging engineering information and instead they're talking about brewing beer or their sports team, don't shut that down. So uh, the fifth uh, literacy that I write about in the book is network awareness or network know-how. This consists of a lot of little pieces of knowledge. It's not really rocket science. It's not even learning the multiplication tables. But it comes from different fields that have somewhat 
obscured these as part of their uh, disciplinary jargon. So, social, uh, uh, network science has emerged recently. Probably many of you are aware of the, the, the research that has been done on small worlds, the power law, the long tail. The, the structure of networks can influence the behavior of individuals in those networks. Knowing something about that can enable individuals who are not scientists to function more effectively. Sociologists have talked about presentation of self, what I want you to know about me and what you figure out about me, whether I want you to know that or not. Um, identity, um, something now called networked individualism instead of the online community being the center that connects people who have shared interests. We're all the center of our own social networks. We all carry them in our pockets and we, we summon them when we need them. Um, uh, reputation, all of these old ideas take on new meanings online. And the person who understands what only social scientists did about social capital, the importance of bridging capital, bonding capital, and reciprocity um, will be a more effective person. I'm, I'm trying to enable individuals to gain more power, more strategic advantage for themselves, but also to enable them by their actions to improve the quality of the commons for, for all of us. And now social networks certainly pre preceded the online world. In fact, arguably we are humans because of our capacity to, to socialize. They take on an entirely new meaning online. And old ideas like strong ties and weak ties take on a, a very different meaning now that technology enables us to maintain relationships that we wouldn't have been able to maintain before. And now in the age of social media and viral media, we're beginning to see some, some overarching ideas such as Manuel Castell's claim that we're not really in an information society. We are in a network society and networks are the structure of power in the world today. And the power of networked publics um, that we, we are seeing the American political system change in unpredictable ways because of the way people are taking advantage of network publics. And of course it's the connection between all of these, seeing what, how they are connected to each other that is really the most empowering knowledge. So network smarts. Networks have structures that influence the way individuals and groups behave. A portfolio of both strong and weak ties is useful both to individuals and, and the network society. If your house burns down, you're probably going to stay with somebody with whom you have a strong tie. If you're going to find a mate or a job, it's probably going to come through your network of weak ties. Position in social networks matter. Um, for example, centrality. I learned that from Mark Smith, previously of Microsoft Research. If you do a social network, analysis of an individual, it turns out that um, the number of people and networks who have to go through that person to get to each other can be more important to that person than the number of, of contacts, number of nodes in their network. Diverse networks are collectively smarter. Tom Malone at the Sloan School at MIT has started the Center for Collective Intelligence to do empirical research on collective intelligence and and one of their first findings is that if you, you want, uh, so collective intelligence, you can take a group of people and you can measure the, the accuracy of their decisions in a way that gives you something that's the equivalent of an individual IQ for that group. And you can measure them in a number of different situations. And he's found that if you take a network of experts about a topic and a network that includes people who are, have no knowledge or little knowledge of that topic, they will come up collectively with better decisions than a group that, that is only um, uh, experts. And also, uh, interestingly, one of their findings, which has been replicated but not explained, is that um, including women in networks raises their collective IQ. People who can bridge networks fill what uh, sociologist Ronald Burt called structural holes stand to benefit. In fact, he wrote a really interesting paper on um, where do good ideas come from, in which he studied the Raytheon company and looked at where innovation came from, and it came from the people who connected networks. Pay it forward. Barry Wellman's research at the University of Toronto 
has indicated pretty strongly that doing favors for others online is the strongest predictor of whether you will receive favors from others. So how can Microsoft help us grow smarter and more mindful of how we use attention, infotention, crap detection, collaboration, and network awareness? That's what I'd like to, to leave you with uh, today. The people here in this room, the people who are watching through uh, video, can help tools, skills, and brains work together mindfully. The technologies and the media have not stopped multiplying. Um, they've gone into hyperdrive. If you want to understand where we're going, I urge you to not just keep up with the technologies, uh, but keep up with the literacies. So thank you for a significant portion of your attention. This is the fewest number of laptops I've seen open in a, in a room in a while. And we have some time for questions. Yes? The online audience, um, you touched on a little bit. So he says, uh, we know that participation makes you more knowledgeable. How can we get beginners or people who don't have the skills on to participate? Because they might be intimidated to have something like Wikipedia if they don't have as much. Well, I think part of that is, part of that is in the tool and part of that is, is social. So any online community that wants to grow and diversify needs to be welcoming to newcomers. So I think that's a, a social norm that, that needs to be spread. But also, I think um, tools with very low thresholds. So um, I hope someone here is working on curation tools. There's another curation tool startup um, every day. I don't think we have plumbed the depths of how to enable people to use, to, to harvest what they're doing anyway in a way that is useful to others. How can we make that really, really simple? So, you know, so Pinterest is what people are talking about a lot these days, and that's really simple. You see something you like and you pin it. Um, as I noted, starting with something simple leads to more complex co collaboration. So I'd say, you know, the next design principle is, if you can start simple, how can you lead somebody to the next step? I know that's something that Microsoft has thought about for years, sometimes successfully, not, sometimes not so su successfully. There was the famous um, um, paperclip um, that didn't work, but it was a, an effort to do that. It's not, not easy when you're dealing with people's attention, but I think that that's a, a question that has not been adequately answered and still needs to be addressed. Yes? very small thing, but did, did I understand you to say that you spoke in this room about 10 years ago? I don't know whether it was in this room, but it was at Microsoft Research. Um, in fact, it wasn't this room. It seems like it had a desk in the center. That triggered my crap filter because yeah. this room didn't exist 10 years ago. But I think it was this building. This bu it wasn't this building? Remember I had lunch there and visited with some people, and then we spoke in a, a room in which um, there was a small number of people, and I was told that there were a larger number of people watching it on their desktops. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, excellent craft detection. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another online question is, how will productivity tools emerge in years to come? How will what? Productivity tools. Productivity tools. Um, Boy, that, you know, the, the question there is, how do, how do you deal with the, the already saturated? So I live in fear of upgrading anything because I'm going to have to learn the new way to do it. And, you know, um, my friend uh, uh, Ming Li, who works in the, the, the link uh, group here, forced me to upgrade um, my, my office. And... Um, and the new PowerPoint, I, I love the new PowerPoint. It's, it really makes it easy to do things that used to be difficult to do. And, and somebody must have sat with a user who said, um, how do I size a, an image? And can I just drag an image onto the, onto the desktop? So, you know, I think we're, we are all, even the people who are enthusiastic, are 
we are overwhelmed with the tools that, that we have. And you have great tools. I use your tools. I, I live in fear of learning the, the next level of complexity. So I think how do you reduce that, that level of, of fear, I think, is, is really important. Because once you get, and also, obviously, paying attention to you know, what's, what is confusing to, to users or what would be more effective for users. Now, you know, I'm not telling you anything that you, you, you don't already know in that regard. But I'm just telling you, as an enthusiastic user of your products, that um, A, I'm, I'm scared of them becoming more complex. And, and B, I've been reassured using the latest Rev that it's, it's easy to, to learn a new way to do things. Learning a new way to do things is, is hard when you're doing half a dozen. So you're making presentations, you're writing documents, it's doing calculations, you've got ways to do it. Why, why bother changing it? So there's, your, your value proposition has to be um, the time you save by learning this new thing is going to be immediately more valuable than the time you take to um, learn a new way of doing it. Yes? Um, just about digital literacy in general. I mean, um, there's some interesting projects around the Seattle area for get, getting this into the schools, but I'm wondering what experience you've had about what age people need. I mean, it seems like it's a skill that kids should get at an early age. I have kids, I know they do a lot of the research online now. Um, they don't just, it's not natural or intuitive necessarily to have to detect when something's reliable. Well, um, I'll say that we have, a, we have an institution in our society that is somewhat endangered that, that ought to be strengthened, and that is the librarian. The librarian ought to be the, the, the person to do this, and I think, you know, you're eight or nine years old, you ought to learn the basics of at least the fact that there is no authority in the text, that, that whether you ask somebody else or you find out for yourself, you, you have the responsibility for judging that. I think they, they need to, to learn that, if not learn all the complexities of how to do that pretty young. I've, I've made a syllabus out of the book that I've made available for uh, college instructors anywhere. I've also made a version of it that I'm inviting high school teachers to modify. There's a lot of fear out there. There are laws that prevent some counties and, and, and I think even some states for an enabling access to the internet without very strong filters uh, on them um, in, in many, many states. You know, I, um, this is, is somewhat tangential, but there's been a lot of moral panic. Parents are afraid that their kids are going to meet predators online. And there's a study done by Sonia Livingston, London School of Economics, a million children in the UK, of, of, wi of which um, I, can't, I, I, I can't tell you um, um, uh, how many thousand of them were molested, but less than a dozen were from people that they met online. The rest of them were from relatives or neighbors or people who are well known. So if you're concerned about that, the internet's not the place to look uh, for it. The biggest danger is letting your kids online without knowing how to determine the good information from the bad information. And so uh, you know, I think the, the, the message ought to be you ought to sit down with your, your kids and at least explain to them that this is, things are changing very rapidly and it's not the way that they've been for thousands of years and you're going to have to learn some new skills. Even if you as a parent may not have those skills, I think it's important to, to tell them that. I would love to see this, uh, some um, elements of this in the grade school and I've collected lots of instances and I've written a, uh, blog posts for dmlcentral.net about teachers and librarians who have you know, third graders blogging. So, of course, you've got to moderate the comments, but a third grader who writes a little paper, you know, a few sentences and gets a gold star, what's the difference between that and having someone in Sweden make an intelligent comment about what you've written? Your sense of agency, um, I think, is more compatible with the way the world is going to be when you grow up than it is teaching in the, in the old way. So I'm, I made a decision myself that I don't know how to change the education system. I'm very interested in making the tools and methods available for teachers who want to want to try. So do you see this as a, basically this is sort of a 
disruptive technology that we need to adapt to. It's just like, uh, uh, I know Heidegger in the 20s talked about uh, Inferno disseverance from, you know, telephone with, you know, it seems like we pretend like they're nearby, but they're actually very far away. And so is there a, an aspect that this is an alienating thing that we are reacting to as older folks that maybe young people would just take naturally? Or uh, is this parallel that previous, previously in history as well? Okay, that's, a, that's a deep question. Let's take the young people part first. I really started thinking about this stuff when I faced a college classroom. And I had thought that the students were going to be like my daughter, who was the college age at that time. Or they were going to be these digital natives that you hear so much about. And in fact, you know, places like Stanford and Berkeley, um, heart of Silicon Valley, you would, you would not, I was surprised to see the blank looks when I said, okay, you're going to start blogging, you're going to start editing the wiki. Um, certainly in every class I teach, there are students who know more than I do, and I, I seek them out and try to learn from them. But I no longer make the assumption that people know the, the, the basics. Yes, they can text with one hand behind their back. Yes, they Facebook compulsively. It does not mean they know how to use a blog to advocate. They have no idea what RSS is. They don't know that Wikipedia can be um, edited with, with one click. They don't know how to use a wiki themselves. So I, I think that these are, you know, it's, we don't stop with teaching kids how to read and write. Why, why send them any further than the eighth grade? They still need to learn how to construct an argument, how to write a, a well-sourced paper. There's a whole a rhetoric that people go to high school for, much less college. So I think that we've got a literacy that's no less sophisticated. But you're asking the deeper question, and I think we are, we're, we are humans because we grasp the world. Heidegger said that. And, and you know, part of that is that we view the world as, um, he called it a standing reserve. It's just ready for us to make it into something. And of course, there are downsides to that, and we are seeing the, the downsides uh, to that. We're threatening our own existence by our unawareness of um, what making things by the billions can, can, can do. Um, I don't know the answer to it, but I think, again, like the book, that becoming aware of the issue is really important. And becoming aware of the fact that people invent particular technologies, not just every tool, but communication tools, alphabets, telephones, um, internets, they change the way we think and they change the way our societies work. We are a, a self-reprogramming um, organism. That's what changes us from all of the other uh, primates. We learn by imitation. Um, no other primate will look well, at where I'm pointing and figure out what I want them to know. Um, baby humans look at where their mothers are paying attention very, very soon. So we are constantly learning from each other and we're constantly learning through the symbolic technologies that we create to communicate with each other at least we ought to know that we are changing our brains and that we have some choice about it. And there's only, we're only beginning to understand scientifically how that works. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>